1. Ja, hallo und guten Abend. Herzlich hello willkommen. And good evening. A warm welcome to our fifth discussion on transitional justice. The Federal Foundation for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship in Eastern Germany and the Federal Government Commissioner for the New Federal States have invited you to this event jointly. My name is Tamina Kutscher. I am Editor-in-Chief of Decoder.org, a media and research platform on Russia and Belarus. And I am very glad that today we are going to talk about three countries which um, otherwise, unfortunately, are present in the German media very rarely, Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Transitional justice processes um, can hardly be realized in these countries because the independence of these states came about with very harsh ethnic conflicts, civil wars, also as a consequence of uh, the Soviet uh, politics between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Since the end of the Soviet Union, there is the conflict about um, Nagorno-Karabakh. Last year, this conflict re-emerged. Uh, Georgia, for more than 30 years, has to deal with the non-abiding regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And these conflicts show how tense the relation between these states is. It also shows how big the Russian influence still is in this region, because Russia is always involved in all of these conflicts. That is why the questions that we are going to deal with today are how does the relationship to Russia influence uh, coping with the Soviet past? Which initiatives of transitional justice are taking place? And what influence um, does politics have on um, processes of dealing with the past. We invite all of you to participate in the discussion via chat or email. We will ask them to our panelists. And tonight, I warmly welcome three wonderful guests. I'm very glad that you joined us. All of the three know each other, and that is why we are looking forward to an interesting and vivid discussion from Armenia, we welcome Evia Ovanisyan. She is a social anthropologist from Yerevan and uh, she's uh, the project coordinator in the regional office of the South Caucasus, Caucasus of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. She was a visiting uh, fellow at the Leibniz Institute of Regional Geography and she is dealing with questions of identity, nationalism and ethnopolitical conflicts. Thank you very much for being with us. Welcome to you, Evia. In our virtual room, we go on to Bilisi, to Georgia, and I warmly welcome Nino Lejava. Hello, Nino. Nino studied international law and has for many years been working for the Heinrich Böll Foundation. She was the director of the regional office of the South Caucasus and of the regional office in Prague and now has founded her own editing house, publishing house in Bilesi, which publishes uh, opposition voices, voices that are probably otherwise heard rarely. And Nino Lejava is also one of the co-founders of SovLab, the Soviet Past Research Laboratory. Uh, this is a telling name, and this is an organization dealing with the scientific um, coping with the past and research on Stalinism and the Soviet past of Georgia. It also deals uh, with uh, historical and political education. We are very much looking forward to your presentation of your work. A warm welcome to Nino Lejava. Thank you and a good evening to you. And I pass on to Sergei Rumyantsev. Warm welcome, Sergei. Sergei Rumyantsev is co founder and board member of the Center for Independent Social Research, CIRS, in Berlin. He studied sociology at the State University of Baku 
then worked at the Institute for European Ethnology at the Humboldt University of Berlin. He was a postdoc uh, fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, worked as a guest professor at the Georg Eckert Institute for International Textbook Research in Braunschweig. And as both are all of the other participants, he has been dealing with societies and cultures a lot. His research concentrates on conflicts, nationalism, historical and politics and politics of memory. So now I've been naming several important buzzwords uh, for tonight. Thank you very much again for being with us. We ask you to send us some statements ahead of our event on the topic that we are dealing with tonight. Nino, after Georgia became independent, it uh, was characterized by um, civil war in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I already mentioned that Russia is involved in both countries and uh, is one of the five states uh, worldwide uh, which recognize these two regions. In your statement, you say, and I quote, in Georgia, dealing with the Soviet past um, and the occupation has become intertwined due to the lack of any systematic coming to terms with it, with the current relationship with Russia as an influential power in the Caucasus and the political challenges related to the unresolved territorial conflicts. This cements a one-sided, exclusively victim-identified culture of remembrance. For Georgian ears, uh, this probably sounds very provocative. Were the Georgians no victims? No, of course, I wouldn't claim that. And I don't want to quote myself, but I would like to ask the technicians in the background to show the, country, the, the picture which I sent to you and chose for this discussion. When you, Mrs. Kutcher, asked us to look for pictures showing the situation in the Caucasian countries we are dealing with tonight, I thought of what I wanted to present tonight. And I refrained from showing a typical photograph from a visual anthropology because on the one hand, I knew that Evia Ovanesian will be present. She is a wonderful photographer, um, among other things. And I thought that a picture of Georgi Gakushidze, of a Georgian artist, would also be an interesting illustration of our tonight's discussion. This picture is relatively new. It was... Um, created in summer as a reaction to a tragic event uh, in the Nguri River. This is the river that flows alongside the so-called administrative border between Georgia and Abkhazia, the de facto republic. On the 7th of April, four people died when trying to cross the river. The Nguri bridge is the only bridge and the only checkpoint at the moment where the population of Abkhazia and Georgia are allowed to pass and pass. And due to the pandemic, the checkpoint was closed. The people who were used, particularly the Georgian uh, population of Abkhazia, was used to move between, to commute even between these two regions and tried to cross the border via the river. People go to Georgia in order to buy um, medical products, to uh, get money from the banks, to meet uh, and visit relatives and so on. I would like to come back to the country. Georgi Gagucic painted this um, 
this picture to remind uh, the reason of uh, the problem. It is his interpretation of the problem. In his view, the Russian army, which um, is deployed in two places in uh, Georgia at the moment, um, is perceived as an occupying power in Georgia. And this shows that the intertwined history of the Soviet occupation and the present occupation is very current. And uh, for several generations, um, Georgians have had difficulties to separate one occupation from the other. And I think that we will come back to this topic in the course of our discussion later. The term occupation, you already mentioned that many Georgians uh, compare the occupation during the Soviet time with today's uh, presence of uh, Russian armed forces in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And you said that many Georgians compare this to uh, the occupation, which started in 1921. You uh, studied international law. Uh, you've been dealing with international law as a lawyer, but you're also interested in the history of Georgia and in coming to terms with the Soviet past of the country. What would you say? How would you... Um, How do you think about drawing such parallels between uh, the presence and history? There was a resolution of the Georgian Parliament of 2010. This was a resolution on uh, the Soviet occupation of Georgia and which steps Georgia is to take in order to uh, deal with its past. In this resolution, it is very clearly stated that the 25th of February 1921, when the Russian army occupied Georgia, that was is a day that was to become the state day of uh, remembrance of the Soviet occupation in order to carry out certain events, uh, commemorative events on this day. Unfortunately, this resolution of the Georgian parliament has not been implemented properly and has done very little in order to support the culture of remembrance. Of course, um, a culture of remembrance does not only contain one day per year. It should contain a much more thorough dealing with uh, this time. But there is, for example, a Museum of Occupation in Tbilisi. That is correct. The museum was opened a bit earlier during the first phase of the government of Saakashvili and the nationalist movement. And it is comparable to the Baltic uh, museums of the period of occupation. However, when you visit this museum in Bilisi, you will realize very quickly that... Uh, history is uh, presented in a rather biased way there. And here I would like to come back to the term of victim-focused culture of remembrance. You can read texts in the museum which show that this is about the Russian and Soviet occupation and um, the perpetrators which are displayed in the museum uh, are only people who came from the north. The museum um, shows little about the perpetrators from Georgia and collaborators from Georgia. 
photographs and um, stories, personal stories of uh, victims are, I wouldn't say they are manipulated, but they are also presented in a very biased way. Uh, they are mostly photographs of uh, aristocrats in order to show um, what wonderful Georgia has got lost. It really got lost, that is true, but very many other groups are not presented there because there were, for example, also farmers um, in Georgia which became victims of the Soviet regime, not only of the Stalinist regime, but also before and after the Stalinist era until the late 60s. So you criticize that certain victims are not mentioned, but at the moment, in your, at the, the beginning in your statement, you also criticized the strong identification of, Georgian, of Georgia as victims. Does the museum um, underline this? Yes, uh, it underlines this. Um, for example, um, if people with... Georgian people are presented. For example, Johnny Kidza, one of the most um, popular um, uh, Soviet uh, opposition, um, uh, one of the most uh, popular Georgian Soviet leaders uh, who led the Red Army to Georgia. He is presented as a traitor. And um, again, there are only very few personalities like him presented in the museum. And the picture that is being created is a picture that hardly shows that there have been perpetrators uh, in Georgia too. Well, if I got this right, so it's very black and white, isn't it? So it means that um, topics such as collaboration or other issues or perpetrators who also became victims later that you don't talk about it. They are ignored. Yes, indeed, that's it. Definitely. And what about, what do you do against it? Because you have, um, you are a co-founder of SoftLab, the NGO. And what do you do in order to differentiate this picture? That's it. Indeed, a very good question. What can can me as a person, what can I do or as an institution? So for quite some time at the Bo Foundation, we've dealt with this topic, we've discussed about it, and we've seen that there is a lack of experts in Georgia. And there has been a lack and there still is a lack because um, you need people who are interested in what happened in the country several years ago in the past. And we've I've also, I'm very aware of um, that time is running up because time is, is proceeding and historic um, research needs time. And of course, um, it's also about forming, creating politics of memory. And this is based on different sources, of course, and resources, resources. And one of the most important sources are um, concrete people. So um, the people who have been living this, who have experienced this. So um, this is what so what we would like to talk to them um, with the witnesses and maybe they are old or um, they they won't be, um, they have been passed away, etc. So what we wanted to do is that to preserve, to fix, to kind of yeah, preserve or make a conservation of those memories. And on one hand, it was important to document everything that could be documented. So to really... Um, get everything, all the information in order to prevent memories to get lost because uh, people are dying or they died because some families are not interested at all in preserving or conserving the memories. And um, this is why we need these kind of documents. And sometimes those family um, just throw away um, those kind of documents because they're not interested in what happened with um, their relatives. And this is what we wanted to do. 
and of course, it was a very holistic research, a lot of research, what we would like to do. And that's why we found this small but very, very fine and nice institution a few years ago in order to go to the archives and to um, dig out, so to speak, the, um, the memories and to get them to get them kind of and to um, to preserve them and to to take them with us and we would like to use them in order to start a public dialogue and of course we have been very much aware of the Georgian government not being interested in this at all and um, of course they did not and they still don't want to open those archives for research work but um, after UNM to Georgian Dream, to the Georgian Dream government, nothing really happened because the Georgian, but also um, the, the foreign researchers um, have to overcome so many um, obstacles, red tape, and it's really complicated just to, to find some letters or to copy some letters from the archives. So from the political side or the government side, there is no interest at all to really um, support or to um, be part of transitional justice processes or to start them, to initiate them. But what about civil society? I think civil society plays a crucial role due to this situation. And we've just received a question from a um, someone from the audience. What about um, the identity of the victims, first of all? And what about the role of Stalin um, in, in Georgia? What is he? Yeah, it seems to be a contradiction. You know, you have on one side, you have this kind of victim identity. And then on the other side, you have this kind of, you know, cult or cultivation or, um, of, of Stalin and that people like him. So what is your explanation? I think it's quite easy um, to, um, to understand because Georgia is a very small country and many Georgians and for some of them, Stalin is not or hasn't been a political figure or personality or person. It has rather been a person who um, came from this periphery, South Caucasian um, periphery, and who left this region to go um, it's far, far away to the big world and to the big world. And um, there are always questions we receive regarding um, his role, the interpretation of Stalinism in Georgia. But there's also a rather older, but nevertheless, um, interesting, very interesting um, research work that has been, or a survey that has been conducted in 2012 in Georgia. Um, by a foundation and we've received the results and we've published them and during this time it was about um, the role of Stalin in the Caucasian comparison or there has been a compar comparison of different regions and 45 percent of the people who have been asked or who participated in this survey said that um, he is rather a positive figure and the other said, well, he is rather positive. And so 21% said rather positive or not that positive at all. And of course, it can be compared, but I don't want to, you know, to make, to draw um, one picture when it comes to that. But compared to the neighboring countries, I think the interpretation is different. But Stalin is from Georgia. And um, this is why I think that people perceive him as a, let's say, public positive figure, especially the elderly do that in, in Georgia, the older Georgians, considering him being, um, yeah, some maybe somebody they know, they can refer to a historic um, person or personality. And I think that there is people like him. It's like some kind of, um, I won't say worship, but kind of maybe there's an adoration taking place and people glorify him in a patriotic way. Um, you just mentioned a very interesting momentum, which is also very important for um, the work 
com that deals with the past. So what about the national identity and the influence of the national identity? And of course, there's also this um, question of sentiments. And I think this is a great bridge to Armenia, to a participant from Armenia, to Evia. You've said, and I would like to quote, that the ever-expanding field of memory studies um, notes repeatedly that the politics of remembrance and forgetting or silencing even affect the construction and transformation of national identities. And you've also said that the collapse of the Soviet system confronted the independent republics, well, the newly form created independent republics, not only with the task of constructing their future, but also of constructing their past. So this, uh, the politics of remembrance and forgetting and silencing and being always put in the same context, they're always in the same context um, as uh, the national identity. And I think that's really interesting what you've said in those terms. And regarding Armenia, we've already said that since 1988, we have this conflict, the simmering conflict um, on Nagorno-Karabakh. There have been two presidents, um, Shirian and Saksan, and they have been um, very much involved in the Nagorno-Karabakh region and one was um, a prime minister and the other has been a former military member and then um, we have Nicole Kishwan um, who is who says all the time that it is about so that um, it means that Azerbaijan and Turkey are proceeding with the genocide of the Armenia, uh, Armenians. So he tries to influence international politics. And this is my question, Via. What do you think? What uh, those kind of words? How do they influence um, politics and and the politics of memory and of forgetting and silencing? So what do you think when people say those kind of things? Is it how? To what extent does it influence the people? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question and the presentation, I mean, the short presentation of my statement. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to mention that for the transitional memory politics of Armenia, the most prominent feature is the confusion of themes and actors of various events and uh, the coincidence of dates and places of remembrance reinforces this fusion in memorial practices. Yeah? Um, I would also like to recall what Nino said, uh, that um, the enemies of the past and present are fused into one uh, for Armenia and I think for Georgia as well and reinforce either the sense of victimhood or that of victory, that is Armenia's case. And um, it's also important, uh, I mean, uh, another future uh, for, uh, of the transitional memory politics uh, in Armenia is the combination of the Soviet and the post-Soviet in ceremonies, rituals, architecture, monuments. And of course, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as well as the complexity and lack of official relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey, affect uh, very harshly the politics of memory, while the later reinforce images of enemies and hinder the transformation and resolution of uh, the conflict. Yeah? Uh, however, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Tamina, uh, overall minor and major shifts and changes in memory politics uh, in Armenia can be attributed to the periods of the rule of Armenian leaders, uh, Lepontel Petrosyan, Robert Tucharyan, Serge Sarkisyan, and Nikol Pashinyan. It's really amazing how the different backgrounds of these people affected the memory politics in our country. First of all, we can see how during the period of the first president, the independent Armenia um, um, somehow renounced uh, the Soviet past and uh, the foundations for nation building were laid at this period. Um, initiated in 1988, uh, this Karabakh movement paved the way for Armenia independence and actually laid the foundations for the construction of Armenian nation state. And it was the main narrative yeah, of uh, nation building and memory policy building in Armenia. 
Um, during the last years of USSR, as you, all, you already mentioned, uh, the movement, the Karabakh movement, demanded the, the transfer of Nagorno-Karabakh region from Azerbaijan to Armenia. And these tensions at the same time uh, awakened and uh, brought into play the memory of Armenian genocide, which became the master narrative uh, for Armenian history and memory policy during this last 30 years and even before um, when he could unterbrechen nur für die zuhörer die da vielleicht so nicht if i might interrupt for the audience if you're not acquainted if you don't know the situation so in Armenia, you talk about the genocide of 1915-1916 by the Ottoman Empire, and round about 1.5 million people have been massacred and killed. And this is what you refer to just for the audience to let them know. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. All that I, I, I did not mention this. And yeah, uh, so... Um, Since the beginning of independence and even earlier, from 1965, the Armenian genocide has become one of the main pillars of the policy of remembrance in Armenia. And even the declaration of independence itself had a special provision stating that the Republic of Armenia supports the task of achieving international recognition of the genocide in Ottoman Turkey and Western Armenia. So, uh, and even more, yeah, in 1995, the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute was established. So this became the central narrative in Armenian memory politics. Darf ich kurz dazu fragen, inwiefern war denn der Völkermord Thema uh, zu Zeiten der Sowjetunion? May I ask you, in how far the genocide was a topic during the Soviet era? Was there a shift? Was it possible? Um, it was possible, or was it possible to speak about it during the Soviet times? And in how far was there uh, a shift after Armenia became in independent? Uh, yeah, it uh, became popular. I mean, it became. It started like a grassroots initiative in 1965. Uh, but then it became political uh, tool like uh, for mem memory politics for Armenia. Like the main narrative in our country beginning from 1965 uh, is genocide, memorialization and everything around this. So uh, it was uh, just used by the politics uh, in, the, in the Soviet period. Then the monument was built in 1965-1967 and uh, later uh, this was uh, shifted to the independent Armenian politicians and they also used it further for the memory politics of independent Armenia, yeah? Uh, so, um, I maybe also would like to shortly talk about and also show some pictures that I've uh, prepared in my presentation, uh, how the um, um, shift happened from Soviet memory politics to independent Armenia, and the first milestone event helped to eradicate the Soviet past was the dismantling of the Lenin monument in Yerevan's main square in 1991. This was the picture that I pre uh, prepared uh, from the beginning. Um, but uh, the dismantling of Lenin's, uh, not this one. Uh, Wir zeigen es vielleicht nachher nochmal, um, Evia, das Bild, das Sie gerade... Maybe we will show it later, Evia. But for now, uh, can you can you tell us something about these two pictures that we see at the moment? Yeah, uh, because they're also about uh, yeah a monument. Yeah, in Armenia, toponymic changes, including the re renaming of urban and rural settlements, as well as the names of streets and places within settlements, began as early as 1919 and included not only toponyms imposed by communist ideology, but also non-Armenian, like mainly Azerbaijani yeah, toponyms. And now on the slide, we can see two monuments on the same square. I mean, uh, previously it was the square named after Meshadi Aziz Bekov uh, in the center of Yerevan. And you can see the monument uh, dedicated to this person who was one of the 26 commissars of Baku commune, uh, but uh, immediately after in, uh, announcement of independence of Armenia in uh, 1991, the monument has been demolished and in, in one night, 
and on the and the square was immediately renamed after uh, uh, um, uh, this physicist and uh, humanist uh, uh, Alexander Sakharov, and uh, his monument has been built in 2001 in the in, in the same place. Evia, just to come back or to explain briefly the 26 uh, commissars of uh, Baku, I don't know how popular they are in uh, Germany. Maybe you could briefly explain because there was this community of Baku which was established in 1918, that is before Azerbaijan um, became a Soviet republic and joined the Soviet Union. These 26 uh, commissar uh, commissioners were uh, shot and were worshipped as heroes in Soviet times. Um, however, they um, some of them had Georgian, Azerbaijani or Armenian background and the monument in Yerevan reminds of one of these 26 uh, commissioners which were shot. Yeah, actually, another monument, I mean, a lot of monuments to leader of Baku commune, uh, Stepan Shahumyan, were still remained in a lot of places in Armenia, because um, uh, he was still uh, accepted as, a, let's say, maybe not a hero, but yeah, a leading um, activist and political uh, actor during this period from 1918 to 1920, yeah? I mean, uh, Baku Commune was very much, I mean, it was, um, as you already mentioned, the um, Armenians, Georgians, and Azerbaijanis were participating in this group and they were uh, finally uh, shooted. But yeah, this image of uh, Stepan Shahumyan, of the leading person of this Baku commune, is still very actual in Armenia. Stepan Shahumyan, the founder of uh, the Baku community, was a Georgian of Armenian origin. And if I may summarize what you are explaining, Evia is a politics of history, as we can see with these uh, memorials, that follows ethnic conflict lines. Memorials that were being um, dismantled and replaced by more um, nationalist memorials, um, memorials which reject the communist past and rather put a nationalist narrative into uh, the foreground. If I may briefly interrupt you here and pass on to uh, Sergei Romyansev, we will come back, Evia, to this topic. But in Azerbaijan, the development was quite similar. And we are going to see a photograph uh, shortly. Sergei, uh, for Azerbaijan, you... In Azerbaijan, there was no real uh, change of elites in Azerbaijan. With Gaida Aliyev, um, a politician, came into power in 1993, who was already um, an important politician in the Soviet era. And we can't really say that the Soviet past uh, was processed in um, Azerbaijan. Aliyev rather follows a nationalist um, line. Uh, Russian, for example, was no longer accepted as uh, the state's language. In your statement, you say the hereditary political regime of the Aliyev family, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and the controversial nationalization of public space are three major trends that shape attitudes towards the Soviet past in contemporary Azerbaijan. In different contexts and for different purposes, the Soviet past is either harshly criticized or justified and even glorified. 
Mr. Rumyantsev, we heard from Georgia and from Armenia and heard how um, coping with the past is changing uh, in favor of a victim's identity or um, a national interpretation of uh, history. What is the situation like in Azerbaijan? In uh, which contexts <clears throat> is the past being justified, glorified, or not being talked about? Uh, well, uh, thank you for your questions. And uh, I try uh, somehow also maybe uh, shortly to reflect uh, to what my colleagues uh, has been said. And first, first maybe I start uh, from your words that uh, Stepan Shalman was Georgian, uh, originated in Georgia, Georgian, but ethnic Armenians like, yeah. I would say that, you know, when we use the uh, some categories, mm -hmm. uh, which are very understandable and obvious for people nowadays. And when we try somehow identify people with these categories, you know, who were living 100 years ago, uh, we somehow entrapped ourselves uh, with these categories, you know, it is kind of a retrospective tele teleology, you know, understanding the past uh, from, uh, Mm -hmm. from nowadays, yeah, from present. Yeah, where we are uh, Stepan Shalman, Stepan Shalman, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. He was born in Imperial Tbilisi. That was totally different context. That was not national state at that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the center of, I would say, uh, a Trans-Caucasian region of Russian Empire. And a lot of Armenians were born in Tbilisi, that was the cultural center, administrative center uh, of the region. And then they, uh, some of them changed this city to Baku because Baku was an industrial one, an industrial city, which was developing very quickly because of the oil bomb. I think a lot of people knew about that. Uh, what makes Azerbaijan more or less famous nowadays, this is the oil and gas, of course. So uh, talking about uh, how in Azerbaijan, uh, uh, researchers, politicians, cultural figures are dealing with the Soviet past. You know, I also uh, want to start with the idea that uh, I prefer the term Sovietization to the term of occupation. I think that uh, the uh, contemporary discourse of, of, on the Soviet occupation is a way of representing uh, the events of the civil war, which happened after the uh, Great October Revolution, so-called, that allows us uh, to reject responsibility for the acts of the Soviet regime. Uh, or um, I would say, in other words, to reject the uncomfortable past. Yeah, in Azerbaijan, uh, the, the Soviet past was uh, reinterpreted uh, under the influence of the events of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, as uh, you said, and uh, Evie also mentioned that uh, for Armenia in Azerbaijan was the same and influence of the conflict was uh, you know, uh, very important to the understanding of how uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan is dealing with the past. And uh, of course, the return of Haydar Aliyev to the power, as you also mentioned. Uh, so uh, even the events of Stalin's uh, great terror, great purge, are uh, interpreted in the same logic. Uh, under the influence of the same events. So how the conflict affected? Uh, within the dominant uh, discourse in Azerbaijan, 
the Bolsheviks were Armenians, Russian, Jewish, Georgians, and only some Azerbaijanis are mentioned. Mm. Uh, that is, uh, I would say, uh, when some Azerbaijanis are mentioned, this is like, you know, a small number of bad sheep. Uh, and so Bolsheviks, uh, they were mostly non-Azerbaijanis. And uh, it was a power uh, which was imposed on Azerbaijanis by uh, some other ethnic groups. And most importantly, uh, hostile Armenians, of course. Mentioned Stepan Shaoman and all others. So uh, terror uh, was uh, committed. I mean, Stalinist terror, for instance, for the reason that there were many Armenians, Russian, Jewish, uh, ETC and so on uh, in the ranks of the Soviet Secret Service. Yeah, and uh, it is a convenient interpretation for the former president, uh, Heydar Aliyev, who started his activities, uh, his career uh, in the ranks of the uh, NKVD, yeah, in the ranks of this uh, secret Soviet Secret Service, yeah, back in the Stalin years. Mm -hmm. uh, his career started in the Stalin years. And then he switched to the KGB general. Yeah, he finished his career in the secret service as the KGB general. And Heydar Aliyev's uh, activity as the head of the Republic during the Soviet years cannot be criticized uh, in the nowadays Azerbaijan, in the present Azerbaijan, uh, just for the simple reason that after his death, uh, he received titles uh, the Savaya of the nation, the father of the nation. And uh, of course, the whole period of his reign as the head of the Republican Communist Party is fully justified. Uh, he turns out uh, to have, it, it like, you know, he turns out to have already fought for the independence and done many other things during the Soviet past, uh, according to the official dominant uh, discourse. And uh, what he did during the Soviet past, uh, that, was did, uh, that was only for the good of the nation and his republic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say, uh, according to this logic, he skillfully hid his anti-communist sentiments for everyone, from everyone during the Soviet period. And uh, I think these are uh, two main trends determining the attitudes to the Soviet past and uh, which uh, shaped uh, the specific of the nationalization of the public uh, space also. Uh, it is like, you know, uh, it was happening step by step, of course. Uh, like uh, if you see this photo, if you have a look at this photo, uh, you can see. Schon eingeblendet ist genau. Sie haben uns ein Foto mitgebracht aus Baku. Yes, we can see the picture you've brought from Baku. Just yeah. told. Yes. Go it ahead. Is, if I'm not mistaken, it was dated in 2008, uh, just before the six months uh, when it was uh, demolished. And it is the, uh, one of the main part of the big uh, memorial dedicated to the same 26 Baku commissars uh, who were, uh, who were uh, shot it, uh, in uh, uh, Krasnovodsk, not in Azerbaijan. Uh, but then uh, they were buried right in this place. So it is kind of a cemetery. Yeah. And you see the youngsters who are, I don't know, meeting on this place or walking on the uh, on the berries. Yeah. And uh, that was also the uh, part of the memorial uh, with the eternal fire, eternal flame. And it was destroyed only in 2009. The first part of the memorial, which was destroyed, uh, if we 
just you know try to re uh, remember uh, the uh, design of this monument. It was the uh, moment when uh, when the commissars were killing, and uh, the main figure on that monument was the same Stepan Shaunan, an Armenian. Uh, and uh, for instance, the uh, monuments, big monuments dedicated to Azerbaijani commissar Azizbekov, uh, Eva uh, Hovanisian also mentioned him, and another one, Georgian Japaridze. Mm -hmm. uh, they existed until, I don't know, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. So only after three, four, five years, they were also uh, demolished. Hmm. It is like, you know, there are Bolsheviks and there are Bolsheviks. There are our own national Bolsheviks, hmm. and some of them are still exist in this monumental type, such as, for instance, Narimanov. The huge monument dedicated to Narimanov still exists in Baku. Yeah. Those who were Armenians or Georgians or others, Russians, they were demolished, of course. Hmm. Also, vielen Dank, Sergei. Thank you very much, Sergei. That was really interesting. I think what became clear is that we talk about um, politics of remembrance and of this historic policies of politics dealing with history and that you can see, and we've also had that um, from Armenia, that is quite comparable. But what I'm interested in, Sergei said that you suggest to talk about um, Sovietization and not of occupation in order um, to prevent a denial of, um, of taking, assuming responsibility. Nino Lejava, what do you think? Is that a suggestion you would um, promote, support when it comes to the Georgian society to talk about Sovietization and not about um, occupation? I have to switch on the mic. Sorry. So, of course, I can um, remember, or I can definitely, I'm okay with what Sergei said, and we're on the same page. And I think um, occupation is one thing, it's also an act. And Sovietization is also a very long term process that has been taking place for um, decades in the countries we're talking about today and that took place in in these countries and especially the results of Sovietization we are talking about today and we can see after three decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union we can see that um, many things are still in place and haven't been changed I would say and also when it comes to the context of this culture of memory or the different cultures of memory and commemoration in, in Eastern Europe or in other parts of Europe, it is um, based on this idea or the situation, how it happened, what happened in former GDR. And sometimes there are comparisons that aren't good ones, I would say, um, with one of the very east countries of um, Eastern Europe and that this kind of processes cannot take place or won't take place in, in these republics. Of course, we know that um, the change, the transition happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, but nevertheless, sometimes um, where the time where in, for example, in um, Germany, we had this time of flourishing, of blooming landscapes and prosperity, but in the Caucasus, it was different. It was it might not have been this time of the, the great awakening, but maybe the time of great hopes. And I think here in Georgia and also in Armenia, um, one people talk about the dark years when they talk about the 1990s and the years of war, dark years and, and the years of problems. And I think we should not forget this. This should be taken into consideration why in terms of the institutions or the institutional side, um, institutions or people did not deal with the inaction or the um, takeover or um, the collapse. But what about today? 
do you think, um, what are the approaches of today? Because we've already talked about um, 2003, um, the fervent revolution. Um, what about this Georgian dream or the Rose Revolution? So what happened? What happened um, with during all those um, changes in terms of government? Do you think that those governments have been quite similar? Can they be compared? And did they not really, what did they, what did they do when it comes to transitional justice? Well, we can't not we can't talk about transitional justice. You know, we it wasn't um, transitional justice what took place in in Georgia during the 1990s. There have been discussions regarding lustration um, of so um, the, with the different archives and the processes, etc. The revision of um, processes, etc. And Edward Shivanaza, for example, he said in 1995 that. When the there was the commemoration, the anniversary of the end of the World War II in Gori, where he um, said that, okay, here we could um, establish a center on for a center should be on institute should be founded for the research on Stalinism and also um, Zagashvili tried um, to dive deeper into Stalin, Stalin's history, and we've already talked about it. And I think it, um, the um, memorial of Stalin in Gori has been demolished um, at night, I think, was even quite secret or opaque. And it, it took place after 2008, so after the Russian-Georgian war. And um, so I, I think this is a symbol for um, this memorial, or it has been symbolic that this um, memorial has been um, horizontal or vertical and not horizontal anymore. So, you know, it is just, um, it was just lying and just right beside um, where it has been um, erected kind of. So, you know, um, nothing really happened and the government of, of this Georgian dream at the beginning proclaimed or had to um, face different challenges, political challenges, especially. So I'm um, talking about transitional justice um, in order to come to terms to revise or to deal with um, the crimes against humanity during Sagashvili's government. And they did not seize this opportunity. And the Georgian society and um, also the Georgian state try to, um, well, the problem is that the institutions are undermined. So talking about undermining institutions, I would like to come back to this, um, uh, you know, this um, demolishment um, of demolishing of the memorial that took place overnight without having, well, there was no civil dialogue or dialogue taking place beforehand. So the picture or the image you brought us is also a um, talking about um, demolishing or dismantling kind of um, this memorial. And you can see that. I think there is this huge, I think it's Lenin, isn't it? Um, going up into the air. So Evia, what do we see? Maybe you can um, explain and switch on your mic. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I decided to present this picture because it's, uh, I mean, it, the, it, the name of the, the title of the picture is Dismantling. It's about the dismantling of, of the monument of Lenin in the center of Yerevan on the Republic Square, uh, previously Lenin Square. So you can see the process yeah, of dismantling and why I picked this picture and also what Sergei said about uh, occupation, Soviet or Sovietization. I would like to also, in this regard, to comment uh, that it's now very actual to talk about uh, colonization or neo-colonization. And in this picture, when we see that the Lenin statue is still in the air, so in Armenia, when we have a lot of monuments to Stepan Shahumyan, who has been uh, executed in 1918, yeah. Uh, and I mean, 
this is very much about the Soviet uh, legacy that is still there in Yerevan, I mean, this picture. Uh, and I think it's the main idea also the author of this picture, Gagi Karutsunya, wanted to put in. Uh, but also it's interesting how later in 2001, on the same place, on the same pedestal, the huge cross was erected uh, on the Republic Square, um, dedicated to the 1,700 years of Christianization of Armenia. So it's really very symbolic uh, thing. I mean, also Armenian Velvet Revolution happened I mean, the main events happened on this Republic Square, and uh, we can see how the memory landscapes are changing from uh, time to time. But again, coming back to this uh, colonial or Sovietization, or how I want to call it, occupation, yeah. Um, with the last war in Karabakh, we can see that these discourses are still very much actual for our region. And we can see how this uh, Russian legacy is still there. Maybe, I will, maybe somebody of you would like to comment, maybe Sergei. Yeah, Sergei. This is, this is so much we heard about the, the process of cultural memory policy of a cultural memory um, how is it what about Azerbaijan what kind of maybe continuation in in this process between Soviet and post-Soviet cultural memory oh, sorry I wanted to speak German actually I'm confused already I wanted to speak German actually I'm confused already uh, this is about the cultural memory of the country which processes and what continuation is there um, what can you see when you look at the Soviet, but also at this post-Soviet cultural memory in Azerbaijan? It is a good question. And, uh, you know, if we're talking about some cultural heritage, we may also observe the differences between Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should have, I think, to talk not about not only about the similarities, but also about the differences to understand the specific of the uh, Soviet regime, the uh, Soviet cultural policy and national policy also. Yeah? So for instance, uh, this picture, mm -hmm. if it is from Yerevan, I think that uh, maybe that was first the uh, uh, monument dedicated to Stalin, which has uh, which had to be the biggest one at that moment but then the monument to the stalin was destroyed because stalin has passed away and then destalinization and so on and uh, on that place they uh, put uh, not lenin but this yeah model of armenia something like that yeah and uh, why i mentioned it because the sculptor the creator of this uh, of this monument was the very famous sculptor who originated, let us say, from Armenia. He was not an Armenian by his ethnicity, but he was a Greek who, who was born in Armenia. Yeah, Georgia, for instance, when the Soviet army arrived to the region, they had a great uh, school of uh, artists. They had a great school of sculptors. Yeah, Nikoladze, who was the cre creator, who established uh, the monumentalistic school in Georgia. He uh, started his career in France uh, as uh, the same uh, Merkurov. Uh, I mentioned him, who was from Armenia. He started his career in France. He was a Rodin student. But if we look uh, at the territory which uh, became Azerbaijan, it is, of course, the question of religion. Uh, it is a question of integration of uh, Azerbaijani or Turk Muslim, Turkic Muslim elite into the imperial project. 
I'm not talking about the Soviet project. Yeah, the Soviet project that was an idea to uh, include all the elites from all the republics uh, into the process, yeah, into the process of also nationalization of these republics. And uh, if we have a look at the Soviet system, I mean this hierarchy of the uh, Soviet republics or federations, we can talk about so-called quasi-nation states, yeah? So what was in the quasi-nation states such as Azerbaijan, which was established in 1921? We do not have even a single uh, artist. Nobody can, I don't know, establish the sculptures. I mean, from Azerbaijanis, those who were ethnic Azerbaijanis. They were Muslims. They did not make any kind of, you know, visuality in there. Uh, mostly they were poets, I don't know. Even, even, they were not a school of novelists in Azerbaijan. So the whole modern Azerbaijani, uh, I would say culture, even culture, and also uh, uh, all the schools of those, I don't know, all these novelists, uh, and so on, they, th this is the Soviet heritage. They got their education during the Soviet time. And it is kind of, you know, the heritage of the, uh, this type of Soviet culture, uh, which they call uh, socialistic realism. So how to deal with it, to refuse it, because it was Soviet, it was, uh, I don't know, the, uh, a tool of the Sovietization of the country, a tool of the, of the Sovietization of people, which is more important, yeah? Or we have somehow to reinterpret it because uh, there were uh, uh, a lot of interesting figures uh, who uh, established, who create Azerbaijani culture in a lot of spheres and have a look at Azerbaijan now, we can see more or less modern institutions, more or less uh, schools of, or modern schools of uh, different people who are producing Azerbaijani culture. So it's a very uh, important and difficult question. Yeah. Uh, especially if we started to talk about the specific design of uh, socialist realism. Yeah. So the biggest part of uh, monumental heritage, which is dedicated to the local poets, I don't know, novelists, composers, and so on, uh, they were uh, established during the Soviet times. If not the biggest part, I would say, but the big part of it, the very big part of it. Should we have to destroy it because it is in a style of Soviet uh, uh, realism, uh, socialist realism? I do not think so. I do not think that uh, in Georgia they have to destroy uh, Stalin's music. It is a very important place. And it's a very good thing that it still exists. It's a very good thing that Mikhail Saakashvili could destroy it only the monument, but not the museum itself. But of course it has to be reinterpreted. Yeah. It has to become a part of the future museum On dedicated to the dictatorship, dedicated to the Stalinist regime, of course. Was würde es denn dazu brauchen? Also What is needed, not only in Georgia, but you also wanted to speak about Azerbaijan and about differences. What, according to your opinion, would be a constructive way of dealing with the Soviet past? What has to happen? You mean in Azerbaijan? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, as Nino mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, what was going in Azerbaijan in uh, memory and history politics, it is not about transitional justice, of course. It is about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Yeah, so Armenian uh, has their genocide. What happened in Azerbaijan? We also need our own genocide. So maybe the first memorial law, 
dedicated to Azerbaijani genocide, of course. Yeah, and it is about the same 26 Baku commissars, has been mentioned here several times, and it happened in March uh, 1918. Uh, I can continue with it, but what is more important, you know, there is no any kind of uh, real influence from European side on Azerbaijani memory or history politics. I would even say it is still very Soviet. I mean, in authoritarian way. Yeah, so it is still very authoritarian. And we can also see that the new cult new cult of the personality which was established in Azerbaijan after Heydar Aliyev passed away in 2003, it is very similar to Stalinist one. Yeah, everywhere we may observe this, you know, sculptures appeared after the mushrooms, like mushrooms after the rain. Yeah, uh, so I would say during the Soviet times, you could not find so many sculptures, so many monuments dedicated to Lenin, as now you find uh, monuments dedicated to Heydar Aliyev. Mm -hmm. And if we have a look at the design of all these monuments, it is, we can say that it is very Soviet or it is very monumental, yeah? It is a question of what uh, ideas we in, you know, put into all these categories, but it, it is kind of, you know, continuation of uh, uh, socialistic realism style. Yeah, all these monuments. Uh, what to do? What we need for Azerbaijan from the European side, it is the very specific and very, uh, you know, uh, educational programs, uh, which are focusing on uh, historians, and social anthropologists and sociologists. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest part of those who uh, went from Azerbaijan to the European Union universities, what they did, diplomas or dissertations on Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, international, uh, something that international happened around this Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and gas and oil pol policy. This is the maybe, you know, 99% of, of the specialists we had now uh, who uh, came back mm -hmm. from the Sergei, European. Sergei, vielen Dank. Sergei, entschuldigung. Okay, sorry for interrupting you. I think you've made your point clear. So what you want is more support from the West also for science and civil society, which um, is um, asking for another way of dealing with politics and another culture of, uh, politics of memory. Nino, um, what about Georgia? You are working at SoftLab. Do you also ask for more support by the EU or whoever for such initiatives in Georgia? Oh, yes, of course. The Georgian society needs support in several ways, and we also need solidarity. Uh, we are losing um, solidarity uh, globally because of other humanitarian problems in other regions. But I would like to remind ourselves uh, there is um, an essay of Alida Asman, um, part of the Vienna series. This is this essay about uh, the European culture of uh, remembrance. In this text, she writes that she summarizes. Um, Eastern European societies, uh, but at the moment we are speaking about uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. She says that the countries and institutions involved in Stalinist crimes need an, an strong impulse, a learning impulse uh, from European countries, uh, which dealt, for example, with the Holocaust in a very specific way and very intensive way. Um, 
Germany was in many ways forced to deal with its past from uh, or by, by other countries. This pressure is lacking um, in Russia and other former Soviet republics. Unfortunately, they are still um, called former Soviet republics, um, apart from the Baltic states, of course. And I would like to point out that uh, the society, societies themselves um, need to initiate such processes. Um, and I mean, individual people or smaller initiatives, they should initiate um, procedures uh, in order to uh, use uh, the new democracies uh, in order to deal with uh, their pasts, uh, which are sometimes uh, very cruel pasts. Uh, this process of reappraisal is lacking, uh, for example, in Georgia. And of course, we need a certain support from the West. But I would also like to point to our local, our own responsibility. I hope that the younger generation, the younger generation also of experts in this field, um, will be interested in dealing with um, historical research. During the Soviet time, it was uh, a problem that decent people who dealt with questions of history usually concentrated on um, earlier history because the history of the 20th century was um, ideologized uh, to such an extent that decent researchers were not able to deal with this history in an academic way. And unfortunately, this tradition is continuing. May I uh, still, may I also highlight that um, young people have to get sustainable ways of uh, of training and have to get the opportunity to work at academic institutions uh, of course ngos are important and um, of course i am a strong supporter of civil society initiatives but um, in order to get an institutional culture of remembrance um, we need academically um, anchored research in the societies. Okay, so structures are needed and you pledge upon society to put pressure on them in order to create those kind of institutions and to be able to deal with it. Evia, so what about you? What would you like to have for Armenia in the future? What is your wish? <laughs> Although uh, Andrei Sakharov's uh, monument has been put in the center of Yerevan, it does not mean that transitional justice happened in Armenia and it somehow again failed as in uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Georgia, as colleagues said. But what I want for uh, Armenia, first of all, of course, peace. I mean, in this worrying situation, we cannot have really um, ideological strong changes in our countries because everything is uh, around the uh, Hura nationalism ideology and it's really harming our youth and younger uh, generation. And the second thing that I would like to stress is of course education first and foremost and of course reflection on historical past in a more constructive and reflective way, as Sergei mentioned, because if we are not rethinking our Soviet past, uh, even our uh, recent past of 30 years and even our last war, we cannot learn, I mean, we cannot move forward. So these are my main concerns for the Armenian future and not only regional. <laughs> Ja, das 
Danke ich Ihnen sehr für die. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this input. I think um, this was a great note to end this, um, you know, this aspiring or aspiration for peace and this wish for peace. And I would like to um, thank you from the bottom of my heart to um, for everything you've said today. Thank you very much for the different images, the different pictures. Sometimes they have been similar. Sometimes they have been contradictory or different. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much for taking part. And we will proceed on November 23rd. Now, I think this will be, today was a great basis for the upcoming event because we will also, um, we come together and talk about the presence of the past um, 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I would like to wish you all the best, lovely evening, and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.